Well, that was very impressive, I must say. The next speaker is uh, the amazing Josh McIntyre. Josh is a Pittsburgh-based software engineer with a passion for crypto tech and teaching. Uh, he started something called Chain Tots um, to help demystify the world of these decentralized currencies. And basically for technical professionals or some non-technical. Josh, you're up. Well, first, of course, I want to thank uh, Fred very much for having me. And uh, Dr. Wilmer and Laura, it's great to be up here with you. Um, we all love to teach, so it's good to be a part of this forum. Uh, so I'm going to talk a, a little bit about more of the question of why cryptocurrencies and why blockchain. Uh, blockchains are, as Dr. Wilmer said, they're getting a lot of attention. There's a lot of interest in using this for things beyond the world of payments and you know, other sort of financial applications. Uh, but it turns out that not all blockchains are created equal. And we do often hear this phrase, oh, blockchain, not Bitcoin. And the, we just want the, this blockchain thing. We don't want all that crazy internet money. Uh, but it turns out that it's not that simple. And so I want to talk to you about the distinction between open blockchains, like Bitcoin, and closed blockchains, and what are the distinct properties of these open blockchains that make them so useful and make them so valuable as a technology. So what are some of these properties that make open blockchains like Bitcoin, Bitcoin Cash, Ethereum, Litecoin, many of the ones that you hear about that are very popular, Digibytes, uh, there's a lot of them that have uh, these interesting properties. So what problems do they actually solve? Well, first, these currencies are decentralized. So there's no single party that controls the validation of transactions, the issuance of these currencies, like a mint, in the way that we see with traditional fiat currencies. And because these currencies are decentralized, there is no central point of failure, they're censorship resistant. And that means that with no trusted central authority, nobody can stop transactions. You can send money to anyone anywhere in the world without fear of seizure or without uh, frozen funds or sort of some of the problems that we do see with traditional financial systems. And because these currencies are decentralized and censorship resistant, they're also global and borderless. You can transact with anyone, anywhere on the planet, anytime, nearly instantaneously, and for a fraction of the cost, the same transaction uh, would be using something more traditional. So I think that decentralization is really the most powerful and valuable part of open blockchains. And these cryptocurrencies, again, they lack a central mint. There's no Federal Reserve for Bitcoin or for Ethereum. There's no central clearinghouse like ACH. And there's no central person, group of people, corporation or government that has control over what happens on the chain. Instead of this you know, sort of system of trust and authority that we're used to, Bitcoin relies on cryptography, peer-to-peer -peer networks, and you know, economic and game theory to secure transactions. And that's really different than what we're used to. There's a large global network of people that are just people like you and I that are running a piece of software on their home PCs, on some specialized you know, mining hardware and that sort of thing, depending on you know, the currencies that you're talking about and what they want to do. But there's just a set of rules that everybody agrees to when they run these cryptocurrencies. There's cryptography that ensures that everybody plays by the rules without trust. And so this means a much better security model than the traditional financial system that we're used to. Again, with credit cards and debit cards, like Dr. Wormer touched on in his presentation, you have a sort of pull transaction model. You give somebody secret information and you just trust that they're not going to abuse it. With these decentralized systems, you just create a transaction to somebody, you just send them funds using public key cryptography, 
And you never have to give away anything secret, and that's baked into the protocol. So it's just a fundamentally more secure mechanism for doing payments and that sort of thing. And not only that, without central authority, you miss some of the greed and corruption that inevitably happens with these traditional systems. When you talk about banking, uh, you know, inevitably people have problems, people get greedy, they try to steal, there's fraud, there's cover-ups, these things just happen, it's, it's part of human nature. But when you have a system that doesn't rely on trust and instead relies on a peer-to-peer -peer protocol and things as fundamental as the math that's involved in cryptography, you just have a model that is a lot less vulnerable to these same sorts of problems. And because there's no central point of failure, it takes a lot more to bring down a network of the scale of Bitcoin or Ethereum. And that's, that can be really powerful. And one of that, you know, one of those points where blockchains are so different and powerful is because of this decentralization, open blockchains have the property of being censorship resistant. Transactions between parties just simply can't be stopped. And that's a really important thing when you think about some applications in society that maybe you and I that you know, live a pretty cozy life here in America don't necessarily have to think about. Uh, you know, imagine the application for journalists who need funding to do important work. You know, imagine being a dissident in a country where your ability to speak freely and you know, receive funding to do those sort of things is stomped down by a central authority. And you know, even in our free society that we have here, in many respects, think about emerging industries. Uh, you know, there's a, a huge growth since uh, Colorado several years ago in the legal cannabis industry, right? There's now a lot of states where you can legally buy and purchase uh, cannabis for you know um, medical use or any use that you see fit as an adult that can make your own choices, uh, but. At the federal level, this remains something that's illegal. And so people that are operating in the cannabis industry do not have access to traditional banking. Uh, there are you know, businesses in these legal states that operate with you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of transactions in cash. And that actually becomes quite physically dangerous for the people running these businesses and having to deal with the problem of robbery and just not having access to banking in the way that most legitimate businesses do. And so that's an emerging industry that can really benefit from having a censorship resistant you know, mechanism of payment that is also digital and also very secure. You know, there's no federal regulators that can come down on Bitcoin. If you are operating you know, legally at the state level, you could accept cryptocurrencies as payment for cannabis and uh, you know, be much more secure than dealing with physical cash. So think about donations to international causes. You know, in an instant, anywhere in the world. It's amazing that you can do that. Right now, the United States government is trying to seize all the revenue from uh, Mr. Edward Snowden, who, is writing a, who has written a book, a memoir of his life and some of the work that he has done as a whistleblower. Uh, there's an individual that can benefit from a decentralized and censorship-resistant payment protocol like Bitcoin. So again, this is just a really interesting sort of shift from what we see in our traditional financial system that if you, as a person of your own free will, want to make a transaction to somebody else, nobody can stop you. And that has a lot of societal benefit. And finally, you know, because of this decentralization and this sort of censorship resistant protocol, these currencies are completely global and borderless, which is way different than our traditional financial system. I mean, imagine trying to send money to your family overseas if you're someone that's an immigrant or comes from an international family. Wire transfers could take tens of percent of, of your transaction in fees alone, and it's going to take days to get there, even months. Uh, Andreas Antonopoulos tells stories of you know, receiving payment for doing international conferences at uh, you know, the Federal Bank of Germany and yet his wire transfer is payment for that conference took over a month to get to him. 
because of just the way that this system is designed around trust and having to deal with counterparty risk and those sorts of problems. So if you're that same person trying to send money to your family, imagine being able to send it halfway across the world. They see it in their wallet nearly instantaneously, fully settled and irreversible within minutes when a new block is created on the blockchain, and for fractions of a penny in fees. That really matters if you're somebody from maybe an economically disadvantaged situation and you're coming somewhere like here to work and have opportunity and provide for your family. You can donate to international causes, again, in an instant. No complex processing, no dealing with chargebacks, no losing valuable money for your cause to fees. Uh, there is a professional MMA fighter and um, uh, an individual by the name of Justin Wren. He goes over to the Congo and helps build wells uh, for folks that don't have access to clean water. Again, he visited the Joe Rogan podcast. They put up a QR code for a Bitcoin address and people from around the world in an instant were donating thousands of dollars to his cause. And every bit that he didn't lose to transaction fees and payments and even just the friction of you know, a donation taking too long and being too inconvenient for somebody to make, got money that he needed for a, a very important cause. So this is just a tremendous shift from the, the system of payments that we're used to. It's a system that's slow, it's expensive, it's unreliable, and it, I think it's being replaced with one that's simply the opposite in all of those regards. So now that we've seen, you know, we talked about the properties of this open blockchain, they're decentralized, they're censorship resistant, they're global and borderless. Not every blockchain that's being proposed actually has these properties. I mean, plenty do claim they're going to revolutionize their industry with a blockchain, but they don't want an actual open blockchain. <laughs> they don't want to have to deal with this tricky sort of democratic process that occurs on open blockchains. Look at a corporately controlled cryptocurrency that's being proposed right now, which is Facebook's Libra. It's not decentralized. It's not censorship resistant. It's not global and borderless. Yeah, they can't operate everywhere they want to due to those pesky financial regulations. It's more of the same centralized system that we're used to. But you know, you put the word cryptocurrency and blockchain in there and everybody's really excited about it. Even though it doesn't actually have the properties that make cryptocurrencies and blockchains so exciting. If one company controls an entire network, an entire system, there's nothing stopping them from rolling back transactions, from stopping transactions. It simply just can't have the properties that open blockchains do, fundamentally, because there's one single party controlling the network. And so this is not to say that all private blockchains are useless, actually not at all. There are a lot of valid uses of private blockchains. So again, let's talk about healthcare records as an example. There's a valid use case there, even though this would be an internally controlled private blockchain. I mean, you can't have everybody's health records on an open, you know, public global ledger. That's sort of a privacy issue. So this has to be controlled by one central entity or entities, right? But it still solves a problem using one of these fundamental properties that you do see with open blockchains, and that is the fact that it is immutable. You can't roll back history. You can't necessarily, you know, have anybody go in and change a healthcare record. And that's important because if you have one single doctor or a PA or a nurse that wants to try to change some record, well, they would have to conspire with the entire, you know, IT section of the company that's managing this blockchain. So it's not globally censorship resistant, it's not globally distributed and immutable, but it has those properties for its specific use case and that you can't have one single individual tamper with a record. But again, for public facing applications like currencies, like Facebook's Libra, having a private blockchain just doesn't really cut it. 
So I really do believe that open blockchains matter and they solve some serious problems in our current financial and social systems and our technological systems. But it, I think it takes a discerning eye to see which ones really solve problems using these important properties of blockchains and open blockchains and which ones don't. So what I wanna encourage everyone here to do is, is think about these properties of open blockchains. Think about why they're important and what problems they solve. Because I want everybody to explore this technology a lot deeper and I want you to understand how it works because that allows you to sort of cut through um, this inevitable phase we have with emerging technology, which is there's a lot of hype and there's a lot of interest. And some of that interest isn't actually as interesting as we might hope it is. So I always like to tell people when I do talks, especially in front of not necessarily technical audiences, you don't have to be a computer scientist to understand at a surface level how these blockchains work and why they have these really valuable properties. I just want everybody to go out and explore this in your own way and really understand these properties and sort of just understand at the surface the sort of computer science that allows these, these properties to happen, a little bit about the cryptography and the economics of blockchains, because that's gonna empower you to understand you know, what applications of blockchain is, are, are good and valuable and which ones really don't solve these problems in any interesting way. Because as this technology continues to emerge, it's gonna be really important for everybody to you know, know what's good, know, know what's bad, and understand it from themselves. So you don't have to uh, go back to the old way of doing things and have some central authority that you trust tell you that their blockchain is good. So again, thank you everyone very much for having me. Um, my website is chaintuts.com. I create articles, videos, and uh, code projects that really just explain this technology, break down different parts of these systems. Um, I'm available for consulting and tutoring as well, and I really just wanna help you understand this more. So uh, feel free to talk to me afterward, please. Uh, visit my website, and I hope to connect with you all more. Oh yes, of course. Do you think the best case for never approving the teacher the, the blockchain uh, of Bitcoin? I mean, how do you think the government will ever accept that all those things will go outside their control? So here's where my sort of left libertarian political views are going to come out. The great news is we don't have to care. <laughs> Uh, because the properties of these blockchains make it so that they can't necessarily be tamped down by regulation. I think that there's a serious, uh, you know, I mean, maybe in some ways, yes, they can make it hard for individuals like you and I that try to abide by the law to use these currencies on a day-to-day -day basis. But there's a reason that in Congress they're having so many talks and meetings about Libra and trying to shut down face Facebook's centrally controlled cryptocurrency. But when they talk about Bitcoin, when they talk about Ethereum, the regulations are really just around sort of businesses like exchanges and things because the reality is, you know, at a protocol level, at the level of people just running this software and transacting you know, on the open blockchain with Bitcoin Cash, with Ethereum, there's not really much you can do to stop it. Again, it's that property of decentralization and, and censorship resistance. So the issue of regulation, I, you know, I, I certainly can't predict how that's gonna unfold, but I, I see um, maybe a future where there is more scrutiny around you know, corporations like exchanges, uh, like institutions that want to use private blockchains for certain applications. But uh, the reason that I think that Bitcoin is not going to go away uh, because of some sort of, uh, you know, China bans Bitcoin again for the hundredth time or the U.S. wants to regulate Bitcoin is that, good luck. I, I really don't think they can uh, tamp it out entirely. It's just... Yeah, but, but the question is how much is going to be used because the 200 billion that is the total capitalization Yes. So, yeah, this would be a place for the 200 billion, maybe. But how that would cover and conquer the, the trillion of transactions that are going on? 
So my other thought on that, just to be brief, um, so I can you know get to what oh, Lauren has to say. Take your time. I um, like this. This is good. My other thought when it comes to sort of regulation and that sort of thing is yes. I mean, the, the government can make it really hard for everyday people to start using this and seeing mass adoption if they don't like it. But the reality is, is I think what we've seen with um, these cryptocurrencies when it comes to uh, you know how traditional financial systems view them. PNC just signed on to use Ripple, which is a cryptocurrency that aims to help with a lot of the back-end transaction processing that is traditionally done by institutions like ACH. Um, I very much believe that you know, our more traditional institutions are seeing these cryptocurrencies as a, if you can't beat them, join them sort of thing. I think that um, we're gonna see a lot of cooperation between the open blockchain community and institutions, both corporate and government, because the reality is, is some interesting problems are being solved. And so, uh, you know, I think as more corporations and, and um, you know, sort of trusted societal mainstays like banks, you know, use this technology in some shape or form that everybody's going to kind of come into the same fold rather than it being a situation where governments feel they have to, to tamp out the technology. And that's that's just my educated guess on where it's headed in the future. Good luck. Yeah, thank you for the question. Okay. Yeah, 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 well, so. <laughs> yes. But doesn't it really depend on the size of the government? The U.S. currency is the largest currency in the world. They're really not interested in being replaced by like anything. Yes. But, so I heard there's some African countries all so there are I'd like to tell this story again briefly if I may. Yeah, I don't want to hold up no, you're not, your time. Yeah. yeah again this a lot of this comes from look we're sitting in a room in the United States any one of us can walk down to a bank with a photo ID get a debit card get access to online banking takes about half an hour, you have some paperwork, the Patriot Act, and, and all of that good stuff. But there are so many places in the world where uh, I think that they're going to s skip that banking infrastructure step entirely. Um, there are use cases that are not specifically cryptocurrencies, but digital currencies. Um, in Kenya, there is an, uh, a sort of pseudo digital currency called M-Pesa. Um, individuals in this area found that they could trade cell phone minutes um, on their network and they started using that as a, as a form of currency and now the company that issues the M-Pesa, these, these minutes, has actually really adopted this as a currency. So there's a use case in an area where we have cell phone towers, we have data plans, but we don't have banking infrastructure and I think that you know, cryptocurrencies are going to be a huge part of those emerging markets. And so to, you know, to circle back to your question of, you know, the, the dollar does not want to be replaced. Again, it might be a cooperation thing where, you know, some places are going to skip the banking institutions that we have. They're just going to skip that step entirely. And, you know, maybe the U.S. is going to see, well, you know, there's a, there's a use case for this that other countries emerging, emerging uh, places are using. And, there will be some sort of cooperation in, you know, as this develops. I don't know exactly. I, I'm being intentionally vague because we don't really necessarily know what that's going to look like. But again, these blockchains, they solve critical problems and they solve critical problems in places that don't have the infrastructure that we have now. And so uh, I think that on a global scale, adoption is going to ramp up in a way that, um, you know, the U.S. is going to and, and other, you know, countries that have a more stable financial system are going to look at that and want to work with it rather than against it. Very good. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much, everyone. I appreciate it.